The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to WCET's February 16 webinar, Understanding and Implementing an Education Content Strategy. We have a lot of content to get through today, so we'll jump right into it. As we go through, if you have any questions, go ahead and enter them into the question box. We'll be sure to get to your questions as we go throughout the presentation. If we don't get to all of your questions today, don't worry. I'll pull those out and share them with the presenters, and we'll get responses back to you next week. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. Thank you so much for joining us today. If this is your first WCET webinar, I encourage you to jump on the WCET website and learn more about us. This presentation is being recorded. We'll make the recording available to you within the next week. If you'd like to follow along, you can access the PowerPoint slides via PDF in the handout pane toward the lower right hand portion of the navigation pane. We also tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel. The hashtag is WCET Webcast. Today we'll move through speaker introductions. Our panelists will give brief stories about their connection to content strategy. Nick White, the moderator, will lead us through a discussion, and then we'll get to your questions and answers. Again, enter your questions into the question box, and we'll be monitoring that. I'd like to go ahead and introduce Nick White. He's the Director of Competency-Based Learning Solutions at Capella and is our esteemed moderator. Welcome, Nick. Thank you, Megan. I am the Director of Competency-Based Learning Solutions at Capella University. I'm also currently the chair of the WCET steering committee and I'm somebody that's really interested in this topic so I think this is a very important topic if you could advance the slide please Megan so this is a working definition of this topic of content strategy so obviously a strategy is something that's broader than an, something an individual does and it's towards some end. So we all are focused on student success in one way or another. We may focus more on affordability, on access, on retention, on innovation in the student experience. But how are we frame it at our institution? It comes back to one or more strategic goals that we care about. And what's really interesting about this topic to me is that I think the way we procure, negotiate for, and deliver course materials or content is one of the most underappreciated and untapped opportunities to achieve these goals that we have. And so what we're doing here today is bringing together a group of people that have been involved in real work, have achieved real success in terms of saving students millions of dollars, in terms of raising retention and completion outcomes for students and the goal here is to have them share what they've seen what they've learned what works what the pitfalls are to make it more of a thing in higher education to have this be a bigger part of the conversation about how we reach our strategic goals so I'm very happy to have everyone here I look forward to the conversation and discussion I hope you've brought questions um, I asked Carrie Pigman, who's one of our panelists, to give us a high-level overview of the situation, the environment. So Carrie's going to do that, and then we'll move into introductions, as Megan said, and then get into some of the stories and discussion. But before we got into the individual stories, I just wanted Carrie to set the overall view of the landscape. So Carrie, please go ahead. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so as Nick said, I wanted to provide a little bit of context. Uh, all of us who are on the phone think content strategy is important or we wouldn't be spending uh, an hour on the phone listening to the, to the discussion today. But to provide a little bit of background, the, the market is massive. Uh, the publishing industry is almost 30 billion and about 17 billion of that comes from textbooks and scholarly uh, content. 
almost $10 billion flow through the college bookstore, but uh, an important note is that less than 50% of students are actually contributing to that bookstore revenue. So 50% of students or more are finding other ways to access content or perhaps going without. Uh, one positive note uh, is that OER is uh, up over just over 5% in terms of courses that are today utilizing some sort of open education resources. If you can uh, move the slide, Megan. The impact on the student of the cost of course materials and the cost of higher education overall is quite significant. So just since 2006, the cost of uh, textbooks has increased uh, over 70%, and if you go back to the 1970s and look at that trend, the increase is over 1,000% in the, the cost of textbooks. So clearly that's a, a problem, a challenge in the market. Uh, depending on which study you read and believe, uh, students are spending anywhere from $650 to $1,200 annually on textbook expenses. Um, and a bright spot, though, in all of this is that the access to digital content is increasing and students, uh, when surveyed, are indicating that they think that digital is the future, that they are open to utilizing digital content, um, but many of their courses don't yet have digital availability. So 56% of students in this particular survey said that less than half of their classes have content available digitally. So they're ready for it, um, but not always available. And I think a dramatic stat and one that we should all take note of when we think about uh, educational content strategy is, is that 65% of students report that they uh, sometimes don't buy course materials because they can't afford them. And so I think if we're asking ourselves this, if this needs to be something that we pay attention to, uh, that, that stat gives us the answer um, pretty loud and clear. Thank you, Carrie. So I think it's clear how big this opportunity is. And if we had the chance to design how all this worked, we would not design it to work that way. So there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, people are finding success at institutions of all types, at the state level, all over the country. It's just not well publicized. So I'm going to briefly introduce each of our esteemed panelists. They'll say a little bit about their interest and role relative to this topic and then after that we'll come back after a poll we'll come back and hear their stories so our first panelist is Andrea Dunn she's the associate vice president electronic course materials at American Public University Andrea could you say a little bit about your background relative to this topic Sure. I've been with APUS uh, since 2002 and much of my time here I've spent in the course materials realm um, so this is where I've kind of implemented different strategies and um, different uh, pathways for going digital and then now going um, to OER. Thank you, Andrea. Our second panelist is Jeff Gallant, Program Manager, Affordable Learning Georgia, part of the Georgia Board of Regents. Jeff? Hi, everybody. Um, I've been working with Affordable Learning Georgia since its inception back in 2014. Uh, I am a librarian. I came from Valdosta State University originally. And um, we have been working on a statewide initiative to reduce the cost of textbooks to students and contribute to their retention, progression, and graduation. Um, while preserving as much as possible uh, the academic freedom of our faculty. So this will be uh, something that I'll, I think I'll discuss later on, uh, but it's a really great initiative and I look forward to talking about it. Thank you, Jeff. And Carrie Pigman, President and COO of EDMAP. Carrie? Sure. Thanks, Nick. Uh, I have spent my entire professional career serving higher ed and 15 years ago co-founded EDMAP. Uh, EDMAP is a content strategy and logistics company and what that means is that we partner with institutions to help them define, implement, and ultimately deliver on an effective content strategy. Uh, we help with finding content that aligns with 
learning objectives and content that's coming from a variety of sources, meaning commercial publishers and also OER, print, and also digital. Uh, and then we help institutions manage the delivery of that content through our platform, OpenView. Um, simplistically, you can think about us as a next generation bookstore, although we don't often like to use the word bookstore as we describe ourselves. Thank you, Carrie. And David Schulman, Campus President for Broward College Online, part of Florida's Global Campus. David? Yes, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I started as far as course when digital content goes. My interest began in the late 90s when I worked for Miami-Dade County Public Schools uh, with a project we had with IBM uh, developing content based on uh, competencies that uh, teachers could use in their courses. Um, I've been at Broad College for 16 years now and since about 2012 we've had a very big emphasis uh, primarily with our online program uh, to build courses that are um, either very low cost or no cost to students, whether it's OR or site licenses. So it's um, something I'm very interested in and uh, also very interested in the uh, idea of strategically being able to plan institutionally uh, to kind of bring that to a larger audience. Thank you. Thank you, David. And now we're going to move to a poll so that we know where you are all at, what who our group is that we're talking with here today. So Megan will, there's the poll, please go ahead and make your choice and then we'll look at the results. Results are still coming in, so we'll just give it another couple seconds there. 72% have voted. Eighty percent. I wonder if we could reach a hundred percent participation. Let's see. Getting there. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Okay, so it looks like almost half are unclear what education content strategy is, so that's great. We'll give an overview of that. The next group, 39%, knows where they want to go, assumedly looking for tips. 6% already have a strategy and a plan, 3% have launched a pilot, and 5% have already successfully implemented a strategy at scale. So I think that's pretty representative, pretty much what we expected the group would look like. Thank you everyone, that's very helpful to help us guide the discussion. So next we'll move on and get short stories from each of our panelists. And so we'll go in the same order. Andrea, please take it away. Sure. So our content strategy really started about 10 years ago. We've had a book grant for our students um, for years now, and it was becoming quite expensive as we were growing. So we wanted to take a look and see uh, where we could um, get some savings so that we could continue uh, providing this benefit to our students um, and make sure that they had their materials on the first day of class and had everything they needed as they got started. Um, so we took a look at our current adoptions and uh, we kind of made a short list of, okay, what courses are using materials um, that are already free online? For instance, an intelligence course using the 9-11 report. We were at the time shipping a hard copy book to the student when it was free online. So then we, instead of um, moved to, instead of delivering that in hard copy um, format to the student, we then moved to the electronic version. So we really took a look at what was also in our library, what we could leverage, um, you know, what was the same title, and how we could 
deliver to a student in that manner instead of sending a hard copy book. So we didn't want to change too much of the content that we were already using or adoptions that we were already using um, to make the digital switch. So that's where we started. Um, we approached publishers and um, we're, since we were uh, a guaranteed sale, you know, we um, purchased for every student, we were able to negotiate um, some lower costs when we went digital with them. And um, that's kind of where you're seeing now with, um, with other schools with the inclusive access, that's where you are able to leverage um, you know, that guaranteed sale to get a lower cost for your students. We also looked at um, faculty and APUS uh, university created content. So um, now we have um, a handful of um, resources that we've put out. Um, you know, we have Creative Commons licensing for these textbooks, and so other universities can adopt them. We use them as adoptions in our current courses for um, introduction to music, appreciation, effectiveness in writing, um, and a public policy ebook. So um, we have those that are faculty created, and then we also have a multimedia team that creates resources and assets for our students to use in the classroom. So we're really leveraging and um, the uh, the expertise that we have on staff and um, uh, creating resources that way. Um, we focus on our licensed materials. Um, we license video collections that we can use it across many different disciplines, so that way um, we can kind of spread around the cost instead of um, paying a high cost. Um, at the, at the course level, we can kind of spread those around at a program level, perhaps, or across the entire university. So we really are now going from that digital, just digital phase, uh, to kind of transition to now moving into the open educational resource realm. Um, now there is so much more out there uh, at the gen ed level, especially. Uh, so where we have our highest enrollment courses, and we're still underwriting those. Uh, cost. So we really want to take a look at the valuable OERs that are out there right now, um, you know, with some of the other partners that are um, kind of curating, such as EdMap, uh, helping curate uh, the resources that are out there, um, and looking at the different uh, courseware, and kind of picking and choosing and allowing the faculty to take a little bit more ownership as opposed to just getting a textbook off of the shelf. So um, it really kind of becomes a more holistic approach as well when you are taking a look at the courses at a deeper level and really making it your own. So some of the lessons learned that we've had is that quality doesn't necessarily have to come with a high price tag. Um, we've tried various ebook platforms over the years, and we would do those um, in small pilots so that we weren't really impacting um, too many courses or committing um, you know, at a high level until we really knew what worked and what didn't. Uh, it seems like nowadays, within the last few years, technology has really um, caught up to what the user needs really are. And um, you know, a lot of those glitches that were there maybe 10 years ago are not really um, a problem anymore. Student responses regarding um, their preference on digital. Um, versus hard copy are still varied. It is a personal um, you know, preference. Uh, our student body is pretty, um, it's not your traditional student right out of uh, high school. It's more the working professional. So some really still like that hard copy book. Um, but when it comes to digital, a lot of students um, really value the offline availability and consistency between courses on a platform so that there's not a huge learning curve when they're going into a class. You know, they shouldn't have to think too much about, well, how does this thing even work? They need to focus on the curriculum. So for us, it seems that um, it, it's a nice transition when you don't really have to change the actual content that the professors are already using. And so it kind of helps with the transition of moving into digital if you're not quite there yet. And then again, and then kind of progressing towards um, 
the open educational resources or library resources to maximize those. Great. Thank you, Andrea. I have lots of questions and comments, but I'm going to hold them so that we can um, have others have time to speak. Jeff, if you're Hello. ready, please go ahead. Well, uh, just a little bit of background on the University System of Georgia, and I'll be posting some links in the chat as I go through this. Um, the University System of Georgia is all of the uh, state institutions in higher education um, in the state of Georgia. This includes everything from Georgia Tech and Georgia State, kind of bigger institutions, especially the uh, University of Georgia, um, to smaller institutions and uh, HBCUs. So we have uh, Dalton State College and Fort Valley State University and uh, Savannah State in there too. Um, we have a very diverse group of students as a result and a very uh, diverse charge for faculty who are teaching um, these bigger impactful courses. Um, one of the big things that the state of Georgia has been looking at is uh, degree completion rates. Um, Governor Nathan Deal announced the launch of Complete College Georgia back in 2011. Complete College Georgia is based on the more nationwide Complete College America program and it focuses on um, college readiness, improving access to completion, shortening the time to degree, restructuring instructional delivery, and transforming remediation. Um, within these, uh, the, I think the belief of uh, the university system at that point was that our strength was in um, our individual faculty and the decisions that they would make on these issues. So they issued out some grants. And at first, these grants um, were called the incubator grants. They later went on to be more focused on STEM innovation and things like that. But back in 2013, um, UGA had a big Open Educational Resources grant get awarded through this program. Um, it was a proof of concept, and it went very well. So um, it involved. Uh, instructional designers from the Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, all working on one particular course. And it worked so well that they continue to uh, teach with those OER, and the Center for Teaching and Learning continued to pursue OER. So this grant project was a great proof of concept and sparked a really good discussion on how we could take this statewide and make it a bigger thing, because it's not just UGA students that would benefit from the implementation of open educational resources or um, our library resources, since we have a statewide virtual library, Galileo. So Affordable Learning Georgia was formed with that in mind. Uh, it is an initiative that runs through library services in Galileo. Uh, it aims to reduce the cost of textbooks to students um, and also the, the big goal is retention and progression and graduation because we think that these reduced costs along with day one access are going to hopefully provide equal access to materials and uh, nobody gets left behind when it comes to content in that way. Um, the big thing that we want to emphasize at Affordable Learning Georgia is that we are not telling institutions or departments or faculty exactly what to do. We are incentivizing um, innovation in this field and then taking those results, those lessons learned, and hopefully growing a community of practice and getting a wide uh, variety of data of uh, different student experiences and student surveys and drop fill and withdraw rates, um, leading to better practices throughout the system. One of the first things that we did to target impact was go through all of the raw data from all of our institutions. There were 30 when we first started out. There's a few less now because we're consolidating. Um, we made the list of the top 100 undergraduate courses and target those within our own grant projects, which we call our textbook transformation grants. 
Um, textbook transformation grants are a peer-reviewed grant program. Uh, we have three uh, faculty and instructional design peer reviewers on each of the um, proposals that come in. Uh, and what we are doing with textbook transformation grants is providing the support to a team of faculty and uh, professional staff to um, implement the open educational resources that they reviewed, they've curated, and that they want in their classrooms. So it, it winds up being less of a, your department is going to do this thing, and more of a, we're going to give you a course release or overload pay in order for you to do this review process, to curate it, to design the course, um, and, and hopefully not design the course around the resources, but find the resources and um, <coughs> revise the resources, given that they're open, to fit um, your curriculum. So textbook transformation grants have been a pretty big success, and one of the great things that we're able to do is summarize all of the final reports that come in. The most, uh, the most recent completed round of grants is round two, which ended in uh, spring of 2016. And you can see through the highlights in here that there's quite a bit of impact already happening. Um, just during these projects, there was $1.7 million saved in textbook costs to students. We awarded 569000 once, and these are going to continue on into different semesters. Uh, student satisfaction, we've seen to be very high with the resources. Um, student learning outcomes, we see overwhelmingly it's either neutral, meaning no change and a lower cost, or positive, meaning that, of course, student learning outcomes are improving. Um, when it comes to drop, fail, and withdraw rates, it's a little bit less on the positive and neutral side, but still um, majority positive or neutral when it comes to how many have dropped, failed, or withdrew from the class when OER or library resources were implemented. And we assemble all of the lessons learned, and so hopefully we are creating some best practices that way. Okay, I don't want to talk forever, uh, so we'll move on. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Uh, that was great. Shows the diversity, certainly, just on this panel. Carrie, can you share your experience? Sure. Uh, so, as I mentioned in the intro, um, EdMap is a company that partners with institutions, and our goal is to provide an enterprise platform and supporting services to those institutions to really support what we call a holistic content strategy, and that's one that leverages the best content out there, regardless of format, uh, regardless of content owner, uh, whether it's commercial publisher or OER. And so what we try to do is simplify the discovery, the management, and ultimately the delivery of high quality and affordable content. And so I'm going to deviate a little bit from uh, Andrea and Jeff talking about uh, their content strategy and implementation and talk about how EdMap came to change our business model about three years ago. So we've been around for 15 years and have certainly seen a lot of change in the industry. Um, I talked about the stats up front in the presentation around the increasing cost of course materials and students not accessing those course materials. So what we were observing about three years ago was that the course materials ecosystem was kind of increasingly broken and the result was uh, it was not serving students particularly well. Uh, course materials were too expensive, students weren't accessing them, and institutions, I think, were um, in many case, cases confused about the plethora of opportunity that's out there uh, to leverage new kinds of content, to implement digital, um, and, and to, to move forward with a more effective content strategy. Um, so we recognized that we had a place in that ecosystem and we played a role in that ecosystem and that, like many others, uh, serving institutions, um, we realized that our business model was really misaligned with institutional goals of affordability and access, the very things that we as a company were helping to drive for our institutional partners. So we began a, a tedious uh, but important effort to dramatically shift our business model away from what's prevalent in the distributor, bookstore, reseller space, um, the 
prevalent model of marking up the cost of content to a content neutral platform as a service model where we're charging uh, for the platform, our OpenView platform, as well as the support services, regardless of the cost of the content that's flowing through our system. And so we as a company transitioned uh, to a business model that uh, makes us completely neutral or agnostic to content type, content format, content cost. Um, which we found uh, made us aligned with our institutional partners' efforts to, to lower the cost of course materials and make them accessible uh, to all students. So I share this story uh, uh, really for two reasons. Um, the first is that I believe in transparency, and I think that uh, in this space the, the problems are complex, the opportunities are many, and I think that um, vendors in the space and institutions have a lot to learn from one another, uh, so it's important that we share our thinking and uh, are transparent in doing so. And number two, I think that the shift that we made in our business model, while certainly not the same as an institutional shift with our course material strategy, we learned, I think, a lot of the same lessons that we hear about, which is um, an incremental approach is important to roll out. Uh, so Andrea mentioned uh, not affecting uh, the, the masses, but piloting with small groups to kind of test and figure out where the gaps are and how to improve on them. Um, communication is extraordinarily important and can't be underscored. Uh, and soliciting feedback and input from all stakeholders, so at an institution that's obviously faculty and students and IT staff and instructional designers at EDMAP, it was our partners, our customers, our internal operational teams, our accounting folks. Um, but having that involvement from stakeholders was really important to us as we made this major change, and I think that's probably a theme uh, as we talk about content strategy in general. Thank you, Carrie. I think that story about EdMaps shifts is really symptomatic of the larger shift going on across the industry. Um, let's move on to our final panelist, David. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. And we began in earnest probably around 2012 uh, as far as uh, digital course and affordability strategies go. Uh, it was the time when there were many vendors coming out with um, options to digitize, uh, to, to put, uh, to monetize, and to put various methods into play to uh, give students content at a lower cost, and also, of course, to provide some of the benefits of digital content, such as being able to um, to remix, to mark up, to search, and so on. Uh, so we looked at that. Uh, we didn't find any one solution that really um, agreed with us, but in the process, and uh, particularly through a symposium we held, we found that we had uh, many faculty who were already involved in um, producing content at no cost uh, for students to use. Uh, so we used that as our basis, but we also made sure that as we went forward and started producing the content, uh, we were a little bit more strategic. <clears throat> and one of the big benefits we had was it just so happened that our IT department was doing their uh, five-year plan, and we were invited in to provide some of the academic input for that. So we were able to use some of the funding within IT, such as technology fee money, to uh, use it as seed money for some of the technologies, such as Flatworld and Lynda.com and some of the other ways that we could provision that uh, type of content to support our courses. But the uh, main focus was really on making sure that uh, as far as faculty went and our instructional designers went, that we had training. So for example, uh, we had training from the Lumen group. And we, just to make sure we were in a good space as far as intellectual property goes, and we started to build out, uh, looking at some of our larger courses, gateway courses, and so on, and looking to honor our commitment as a college, which is to be an affordable uh, resource for our students. So over the years, we've been able to do that. We have a benefit in that we have a collective bargaining agreement, which uh, 
we, in which we contract with faculty to do course development. So that it allows us to have a mechanism to pay faculty to develop, to work with our librarians, uh, instructional designers, and to produce either open or low-cost versions um, of courses. And within that agreement, there is also a stipulation that faculty maintain the course for three to five years. So there's a way to um, ensure that the, the courses are current. We uh, have also benefited from some of the organizations like CCC, OER, and um, really the explosion in OER worldwide. Also things like OpenStax and the high level of OER that are now available um, in many cases to use. On the other side, we went with traditional content, but we had very aggressive negotiations with publishers. For example, on a college-wide level, we wanted to improve um, gateway course success in mathematics and in English. Uh, so we got very good pricing for things like Alex and MyLabs and so on uh, to help use that courseware and to not put a burden on the students um, so that we could absorb it as an institution. Within the state of Florida, we also have an organization called the Florida Virtual Campus, which is the state's organization to help uh, manage and coordinate e-learning. And one of the initiatives which is very much pushed through there and pushed by the state is affordability. So we do have an affordability uh, subcommittee, a content subcommittee. And so as a state, we are looking at ways that, for example, we can um, have shared repositories, shared courses, and uh, to get much more um, exposure for those types of products. Uh, grants have helped as well. We are working with a ATD now, Achieve the Dream, and about uh, 30 other colleges to produce um, fully OER degree programs. We actually do have quite a few programs now that are fully OER, and um, at least half of the courses that we put out are um, at no cost to the students. But the, um, the ATD is a really interesting one because it means that we now have 30 other institutions developing full degree programs, fully OER, and so we will be um, developing and being able to use those kinds of resources. The uh, state of Florida is also very involved with affordability, and uh, as of, I think, last year, each board of trustees now has to produce an annual report for the state that addresses affordability and what the college is doing. And uh, the state is putting in some kind of measures, like, for example, making sure that uh, students are not buying textbooks that won't be used in the courses. And uh, we probably all had that experience ourselves, where we've gone to a bookstore and then ended up in a course where one book wasn't used or just a portion was used. Also looking at whether or not it's essential to upgrade to a new version and not being able, you know, perhaps sticking with the older version, uh, putting notices out in a timely manner so students know what textbooks are available and what the costs are. Um, as far as our own campus, for the online, it's been a no-brainer. It's, it's very easy for us in this digital format to grow um, OER and low-cost material. One of the things the ATD grant is helping us do is it's helping us also build content that we are pushing down to uh, be used with our blended programs. And as an institution, we're starting to um, also do professional development, not just for faculty who are teaching online or working online, but to grow the use of um, open content. So we're, we're on the road. We are saving, we estimate we save students about $3 million a year annually um, with our campus for the fully online courses, and we're trying to extend that uh, for all of the benefits that have been mentioned by the other panelists, including things like having students have the materials that they need on day one. And because we have overseas students, it's extremely helpful to not have to deal with a textbook issue. So it's uh, been very beneficial. We are very messy at the moment and looking for some kind of grand unifying strategy to pull it all together over the next few years. Um, but so far, we're making good progress and really pleased to see it growing as a, a national um, incentive to do. Thank you.
Nick, your mute button might be on, but we'll go ahead and launch into the next poll here. So who is leading or should be leading course material strategy at your institution? So I'll go ahead and launch the poll. We had about 85% participation in the first poll question. Let's see if we can get ahead of that. We're on track. Can you hear me now, Megan? We can. Yeah, the little thing on my cord got bumped. Sorry about oh. that. Oh. <laughs> I was saying we heard a lot of a wealth of tactics across those four panelists of how to be successful. So I hope everybody's queuing up questions for our panelists as we do this. And yeah, I don't think we'll get 100% participation on this given half the audience roughly hasn't started yet. So probably pretty close to the full participation we'll get. And there's the results. All right. 73% is being led by academics, 15% by the library, 2% by IT, and 10% other. So this is a big, important operational question. Where is the leadership that's bringing it forward, and how do you get you know, executive leadership buy-in and support across the organization? Always a topic we come back to with change initiatives like this. So now we're moving on to moderated discussion. So we do have a question box. Feel free to enter the questions. I wanted to bring one simple one forward. Andrea mentioned inclusive access. That's a relatively new term. So, Andrea, can you define that for the audience? Sure. For us, um, it's really the, the book grant that we've been providing the students. From what I've seen, um, for instance, at the Textbook Affordability Conference last year, um, many um, state schools and other schools that don't have a um, uh, book grant or other things like that, they are moving to perhaps adding a fee or um, tuition inclusive um, course material costs so that way the student has access to uh, the electronic version of their courses on the first day of the class and they don't have to worry about uh, heading to the bookstore or perhaps um, you know, it not being paid uh, in time with any financial aid issues they may have, you know, it's all kind of taken care of by the school. Thank you. And yeah, there is good research showing that that day one access for all students does help with retention, completion right. of courses, and moving on to the next course. So we have a question for Jeff or anybody. How much time is spent on link checking with OER? and content that's uh, not created in-house. And who takes the lead on that? Well, uh, both of those are kind of a murky it depends. Um, on our textbook transformation grant side of things, um, it depends on the group. Their proposals have a transformation action plan as part of them, and that plan defines the roles of each team member within the project. Uh, for example, maybe you have a very big instructional design department at your institution. Well, that's great. You might have an instructional designer be the instructional designer. Um, you may have a smaller institution where you may not even have one instructional designer throughout the entire campus. So maybe one faculty member um, works on design and another faculty member works on um, authoring some content that they hadn't found. So when it comes to who takes the lead um, on any task, it really depends on the team. Now when it comes to link checking for library resources or OER that isn't either created in-house or hosted in-house, um, that will also depend on the team and it also goes into plans for sustainability. 
um, there's a sustainability plan in every single one of the applications. And that would be where they define how often they are updating the resources that they are um, keeping. So for example, if you have, um, as librarians would know, a libguide, uh, a web-based guide that points you to a whole bunch of resources, um, checking those might take a while. So you would have to plan that out and that would have to be in the application. Um, we do go over in our kickoff meetings that um, while linking to uh, free things and stuff that's out there, uh, linking itself in the United States is not infringement. It does have a sustainability um, aspect to it that increases the time um, for taking care of these materials. So there's an awareness of it, but it really depends. Um, some people have created an entire open textbook on their own and they host it on their own. Um, they host it in their LMS and we host it in our repository and there's hardly ever a change to those links. But some groups do have a very large collection of curated links that can be permalinks to library resources or out on the web and those do take more time. Um, I can't give you a number, but hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, this Thank is, you. Uh, David. Um, oh, go ahead, David. Yeah, I'd also add that uh, one of the things we're trying to do is not have um, links out to 20, 30, 40 different uh, types of content, but where possible to bring the content into the course so that the user experience is a very natural natural one of flowing um, through the course and not the feeling that uh, this is some kind of tapestry that's put together with uh, you know something from this side, something from that side, things that don't quite match. Um, so, so that's one way of doing it. The other thing is uh, the the development and the use of uh, master courses so that the instructional designers, when a term starts and when courses get copied into shelves, particularly for adjunct faculty, that um, those courses have had a quick review to make sure that everything is um, up and running. So that's one of the ways that, that has helped. But of course that also means you have to have a librarian or somebody help you with the IP side of things so that uh, sometimes you will have to link up. You cannot just uh, copy and absorb content, but um, preferably that's what you would do, that it would all be very naturally in the course and the experience of the learner. And Thanks, uh, David. That I'll was actually, oh, uh, was that Carrie? Go ahead, Carrie. <laughs> yeah, it was. I was just going to jump in and just comment on something that both uh, Jeff and, and David mentioned, which, I mean, the promise of OER is that it's it's free or close to being free, but the, the point here with the question around the links is that there is cost involved and whether that's human resource cost, you know, Jeff mentioned the team of instructional designers who are responsible for doing this, Dave and you talked about librarians who are checking links, so there's either a human resource cost or potentially an institution could choose to uh, invest in having the OER content either hosted or um, put into a platform that m makes the the content available and uh, can be integrated directly into the course rather than linking off to a variety of places. So I just wanted to kind of underscore the point that there are, you know, there are other things that need to be considered around, you know, whether spending money on resources to make sure that things stay available or potentially looking at uh, platforms which can help um, make sure the content is, is c consistently available. Yeah, a sustainability plan and thinking ahead about how you'll manage those links is really important to the success of this kind of initiative. You both touched on one of the questions that came through the question pod, which is, and I'll address this to David, what percentage of the courses are self-contained so that there aren't links going out that you need to worry about? And what percentage do go out? And a second question that's kind of related is, how do you provide faculty with orientations since they come with such a wide range of backgrounds when you're talking about an OER initiative? Well, the, the percentage I really cannot give you uh, off the top of my head, but I can tell you um, from the aches and pains of uh, linking out and using external resources that we're still attempting for the most part to pull things in, but sometimes that doesn't work. Um, 
we, for example, and a good example of that is we work quite a bit uh, with flat world content, but we have been consistently disappointed in um, the upkeep of the tool and its integration into our learning management system. So there are ongoing um, problems uh, so far as that goes. Basically, the best solutions that we have are when we have faculty who are creating content with the support of um, library resources, instructional design, and we're not overly concerned about the external um, access. However, there are things that are out of our control. We have a college-wide initiative that says every person taking Composition 1 is going to be using uh, my labs. So regardless, we, we have to build that in. And as you all know on the line, even under the best circumstances, um, those external links can be problematic in a variety of ways. Um, I didn't get the question about the orientation. What, what I didn't understand that. There was another part to the question? It seems like um, uh, Mr. McGuffin is uh, trying to develop a series of online orientation videos uh, for his faculty um, who are interested in using OER. Uh, I think that's right. Uh, Stephen, if you want to add in chat about that, that would be great. Um, oh, this is correct. Okay. Um, on, from our angle, um, training uh, materials really have to include as much active learning as possible when it comes to faculty training. So um, if you absolutely just have to use a series of videos, I would have those videos be somewhat short and point out something that that individual faculty member should do next. Um, you know, so they can delve into, uh, for example, OER Commons and see what that looks like as opposed to looking at a small collection in OpenStax. Um, because their needs are going to be so specific to their subject in some, time, in some ways and specific to their pedagogy, I think the more active and the more individual you can make that learning, the easier it's going to be. So I would say if you only are doing videos, have them point somewhere, but maybe have it mixed and have uh, at least have them link out or answer some uh, open-ended questions about what they're seeing. And I, I, I kind of point, one of the, the models I really like is if you've ever done, I think it's the Coursera courses, and you've gone through their videos, and within the video tool they have prompts in there, and so you're not just walk, watching the straight video, um, you know, it's, it is an interactive experience. Oh yeah, I agree, the Coursera model is very good for that. So I'm curious if the panelists can give any advice on how you go about negotiating with publishers if we believe publisher content will still be, you know, a component of a long-term strategy. How do you achieve those savings? Well, we, we bully them because that's all we do because we're large and um, so, and it's not always easy. It's the same thing with um, accessibility. Uh, you know, you have to keep up on them. but we just went after them and we had enough scale that it, it helped us. The other thing is we've also talked at the state level about state licensing and I think um, that's another way to either state or consortium to get uh, the pricing you need. Uh, yeah, and I think that um, also showing success outside of their models may bring them in and, and have them either want to cooperate or to compete with the models that are already there. Um, I mean, at the moment, we are showing uh, just through these projects um, that you can have a successful calculus implementation without uh, my math lab, or you can have a successful um, economics course while using a free and open textbook. Uh, after a while, they'll be looking at their revenue and wondering what it is they can do to uh, to partner up and to use their human resources and their expertise in a more constructive way than a $300 textbook. I think we're starting to see that. They're starting to come around. Um, it, it'll take some work. Yes, I agree. And another thing I'd add is that 
they do have an incentive to participate in this kind of approach too because they don't then compete with the used book market and they have um, you know a hundred percent sell through at this lower rate so it's not told they're not unreceptive to this kind of approach it's important to yeah. understand yeah, yeah and sure. I think Nick I would add to that um, I think that in in our experience institutions with you know as few as 1500 uh, students can negotiate deep discounts um, and for exactly that reason that today you know that that earlier stat that 50 percent of students aren't buying course materials um, publishers are you know deeply incented to ensure a hundred percent are and so if they can do that through offering deep discounts then you know everybody wins that affordability issue is is oftentimes answered and um, the publishers are getting the the sell-through that, that they're looking for. So I think engaging in those conversations can be worthwhile, uh, no matter the size of the institution. Although I'm, I'm sure bullying doesn't hurt, David. <laughs> <laughs> so the time has gone very quickly. We just have five minutes left. I think one of the most interesting things about initiatives like this is that you can see the benefits really quickly in terms of money saved and higher rates of course completion. But I think there's also a huge opportunity longer term so I'd be interested to hear from the panelists where you think this will be in five or ten years what are the longer term benefits you foresee I think you'll see more going out into the open educational resource space um, you know right now there's a lot of gen ed out there um, and we're missing some of the upper level stuff but hopefully um, people will expand into those areas as well and we can become less publisher, um, you know, uh, reliant. So this is uh, David. I think one of the areas that could be very beneficial over the next few years is the ability um, to get together and to build better ancillaries because that's an area where it's sometimes very hard to, and talking about pain points, for example, creating massive tests bang simulations and, and some of these other high-end um, things and um, sort of the, the content that the publishers are not trying to disaggregate to maintain um, their market. So if more of that can be built and maintained at a low cost, I think that will be um, a trend as well. And I would say that the, the promise of developing a content strategy now is that you're laying the foundation for uh, content types and formats that we might not even know about now. I mean, new technology is is coming up almost every day. We're learning about new offerings, and so building a content strategy and answering the hard questions around sustainability of that strategy, around management of that strategy, you know, who's involved, who carries it forward, are all really important foundational efforts that need to be undertaken so that you know in two years and in three years or five years um, an institution can capitalize on the opportunities that are out there and I I agree with everything that was just said um, I would also add to really keep an eye on the future of educational technology um, right now it's in a bit of a an infancy of sorts when we're talking about um, artificial intelligence but coming down the line we're going to see a lot more sophisticated machine learning and what may have started out as a content strategy may become a more broad learning strategy or we may be completely redefining what we mean by content or process in general Thank you, everyone. I just add that once all of the content is digital and online, there's a big opportunity around analytics and looking at that data and correlating it with other data to support student success. We had one final question about accessibility related to OER in this last minute or two. Does anybody want to address how they think about accessibility since that's so important? You have one to of do it. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the great things about um, open educational resources is that they are openly licensed and therefore you can change them and no one's going to chase you down over copyright. So you could make a more accessible version of something that wasn't so accessible, which is nice, 
but as any accessibility professional will tell you, retrofitting um, accessibility onto a non-accessible item or building or textbook um, is a really hard task as opposed to designing it accessibly from uh, the ground up. We have a kickoff meeting for every single round of our grantees and we discuss accessibility there and provide a lot of different resources for them to get started. Um, I feel like it's not enough. I feel like accessibility should be even more prioritized. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing. I think that there is a positive relationship in that you have the permission to do it um, at any point because of those open licenses, but there's also responsibility of making those new OER as accessible as possible right out the gate. That's a great point. We're out of time, so I'd like to heartily thank our panelists. It was a great discussion. I'd like to thank all of our attendees and all the questions you brought. Um, I hope to continue the conversation in other venues at other times. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, all. Thank Wonderful thank job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.